a reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be in lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves of every kind, in which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals. Of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over everything living that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Good morning again. So this morning, well, first of all, all of our families have idiosyncrasies. I'm sure yours does as well. One of the things that I've realized for a while is that Hushka men don't buy new tires. You have this dynamic in your family. Like I, I remember my grandpa, who I knew well, uh, he, he would he called them baloney skins. He would he would run his tires until he could see the thread or the wire, depending on the type of tire. And he always thought that was really neat when you could see the wire in his tires. And and then even my dad, like when Teresa and I were first married and broke, he had this geo tracker that he would bought off someone that he worked with that had wrecked it. And so he gave it to us to drive for gas mileage, which was awesome. And it rode really rough, and part of the reason was every one of the four tires was a different make and brand of tire and and tread pattern, and it was just this janky thing that got really good gas mileage. And so I've taken pride in the fact, like, I don't do that. 
I, you know, sometimes you overreact, right? And so I'm like, I, I just, we buy good tires. I don't want to mess around with tires. I hate flat tires. I don't want to fix a tire on the side of the road. I don't even know if I would know how to fix a tire on the side of the road. Just kidding, I would. But, and, and so when it's time to get tires, I just take it down and probably spend more than I should and we buy tires. But then I realized this week that it did creep into my DNA and, and that was on my bike. So in the very same way, like for a couple months now, my friends that I ride with have been bugging me because my back tire is just so bald. And it's not that we couldn't afford to f replace it, it's just that we were choosing not to replace it. And mostly, again, in hindsight, I realized like, no, mostly I was playing that, that thing that Hushkas do to like see like how much life can I get out of this tire. And then recently I had a couple really close calls because I have no traction and I almost ran into another biker. At least it was a biker, not a hiker. That would be okay, I think. And so I was like, okay, I got it, I've got to get it, I've got to get a new, well, I mean, because if we run into a hiker, we're all done. But if you run into another biker, we can work it out. <laughs> so <clears throat> I recently bought a new tire. Last Monday, I put the tire on my bike, the exact same tire that I had before, only new with tread. Tuesday, I took it on its maiden voyage. I was with some friends. We came across the top of Ascension. We're dropping down entertainment right into the forest, for those of you who know this area. And there's this there's this fork literally in the road when if you go left, which is where you're supposed to go and drop into the trees, there's this pile of rocks and it's kind of this fun technical thing to kind of leap over. But you may remember Tuesday morning it rained a whole bunch, especially downtown. Like Candace said out in the valley, it didn't rain that much at her house, but it just poured downtown, which in biking parlance means the trails were perfect, like hero dirt, except for when they're not. And then they're slimy and muddy and so, and it was also, it's that time of year if you ride after work where like you can't really see because the sun's in your eyes. So I was just a little bit tentative the whole ride and I hit that spot and in a split second I was like, I'm going to go around that because I was just feeling a little tentative and I went around it and as fortune or luck or whatever would have it, as soon as I went next to it, I felt the air just explode out of my tire. Pulled over, found this giant gaping hole in the top of the tread, quick grabbed a CO2 thing and put it in there because there's this liquid inside the tire and maybe that'll seal it even though I'm like, it's not going to seal it. But I got to try and went another 10 feet flat again. And then they make these plugs that you can use in these instances. And I've looked at them in the bike shops like a bazillion times and I've always been too cheap to buy them. Now I get to buy two because now I need one and I got to replace the guy who gave me his to use in this instance. Long story short, I got the thing on the trail again, actually finished my ride, got home, knew I wanted to ride after work the next day, was home alone, was trying to fix the tire, had some time, knew that I didn't want to wake up in the morning to a flat tire because I wouldn't have time to fix it. And so I worked on it, worked on it, had it, finally, I, I put some more goo in there and some grainy goo because I'm about to the end of my goo. I think I had the thing sealed. And then I grabbed my tire one last time and when I squeezed it, I heard a whole new source of air. And that's when I discovered the whole sidewall had been, not the whole sidewall, there was just this cut in the sidewall, which in bike world means the tire shot. So that tire is in the dumpster, headed for the landfill, and it had less than 10 miles on it. It's kind of funny, kind of. <laughs> but it was that night, I think I was laying in bed that night when I was like, this is kind of ironic, because... Uh, as we talk about the mental game and back to the basics and how do we acknowledge all the tools we have available to us and then how do we grab hold of more ancient ideas that maybe we've taken for granted or lost sight of, what I intended to, to work through this weekend and what I re reworked through this summer what was, was this idea of control and, and, and the, the, the tricky nature of how do we nuance like when we have control and when we don't, don't and the hard work of being human, of building the maturity to be able to, to differentiate like I do or I don't in this instance. Like here, here's the question, maybe to put it a little more clearly. Next slide. What if a strong mental game requires maturing in your ability to discern when you have power or where you have power and when you don't or where you don't? I don't expect this morning will be anything new for anybody. I think part of the value of this coming together is, is the sitting with ideas that for most of us we believe in, but life happens so fast we, we miss them. And again, here's what I want to explore is, is how, do we, how do we become better at recognizing the areas where we do and the areas that we don't. And I think the other word I want to give some emphasis to, and this just keeps coming up for me in this mental game thinking and conversation and process and learning is the role of maturity. That, that there's certain things that it doesn't matter how much we know they're true, it just takes some life experience to kind of get beat up by it. And part of the, the mental game when you're 17 years old is just the revisiting of these ideas and recognizing that with time, you'll get better at it. 
You know, I, I think about, like, imagine the three-year-old playing YMCA soccer. I mean, it's barely even a sport. Right? It's this mob ball thing. And then uh, imagine the difference between a three-year-old playing soccer uh, versus an eight-year-old playing soccer. And suddenly there's like positions and teams and competitiveness and coaches who know what they're doing. <laughs> and then imagine the difference, between, like, the difference between an eight-year-old soccer player and a 12-year-old soccer player who's competing to be on a travel team and competing to be a starter and competing for state championships. But then the, again, the difference between a 12-year-old soccer player and a freshman in high school soccer player. But then again, the difference between a freshman in high school soccer player versus a senior in high school soccer player. But then there's huge difference between that senior in high school soccer player who might be dominant in the state and, and the freshman in college soccer player. But then the difference between a freshman in college soccer player and a senior in college soccer player. And we could just keep going. The difference between a senior in college soccer player who's maybe an All-American and an MLS soccer player. And then the difference between an MLS soccer player and a World Cup soccer player. And I hope because I think what's happening to me in this series, and I hope what, what's happening to you, is part of the mental game is just, part of what it means to be human is to create space for growth and maturity and to hopefully get better at things with time, which doesn't happen by default, but you also can't fast forward it. Like, I'm convinced that the, the grandparent phenomenon is ultimately this very same thing. That there's things that you can't control in a three-year-old's life, and as a grandparent, you know that, and you're so excited to get a redo. Isn't that got to be part of it? But you can't put that on a chip and, and put it in somebody who has a two-year-old's head. Like, it just, it doesn't work that way. So what if part of the mental game is somehow developing the connection with God and at the same time just this, like, grace towards self that recognizes that, that with time we get better at nuancing that which we do and that which we don't? I mean, look at Genesis 126, and the reason I wanted to jump into Genesis was just, it, it so speaks to what God wanted to do when he made people. Look at 26, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, icons, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Like, if you're a control freak, it's this verse's fault. It's this truth's fault. Right? Because this God made you for power. He made you for control. And yet part of being human is we often misuse it. I had this great interaction with a friend a while ago when I was telling him, like, like the deal was, like, or the deal is I know I'm a control freak. And I can admit that. I said the worst thing is is when you're in a relationship with someone and you know you are and you know they are, but they don't know they are. You know that thing? And, and he did this hilarious thing. I was like, yeah, because I'm going to control freak. And he goes, yeah, now your turn. <laughs> I love that. I think more of us are control freaks than we like to realize. It just manifests itself in different ways. Why? Because it's, on some level, it's God's fault. Or maybe better said, it's God's design. Like, could God have created a creation where you weren't needed to have the responsibility and the roles and the power? Yeah, theoretically. And yet something about what makes us uniquely human, and there's something humbling about the fact that we're sitting with a verse that's been wrestled with for thousands of years. I mean, even before, before Jesus, there was this deep kind of abiding in this, like, what does it mean that we're made in God's image? And part of what it means is you're made for power, which means that every time a relationship goes bad because there's a power struggle, like, it's from this. It means every time you look at something, doesn't it? And every time you look at something and go, I could do that better. That, that fine line between being a critic and being someone who values excellence, it's, it's, it's God in you. I was listening to my friend Dave train somebody this morning on setting up, and he handed him those cards, and he handed him the cards, and he goes, okay, there's a right way to do this, and if you can't do it right, don't try. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. And then I kind of was like, good job, Dave. And he's like, you taught me that. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's a, it looks good when they're all going the same direction and the pen's on the same side. And then I actually watched him go for several rows and like fix card after card after card. It was awesome. This is, this is the way God made us. Look, look at verse 28. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And then have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves along the earth. You know, we've explored in the past, like Jesus shows up and he goes, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Rethink your plans for living. There's this whole new way of doing life. What is that? It's one where you take your dominion and you invite God to run it like he would if he was you. Like every, everyone in the room has, they have, you have a kingdom, you have a queendom. Whether it's a two-year-old who has a favorite car or it's Jeff Bezos with zillion dollar empire or something in between, we, we, we have dominion. God made us for that and yet the fact that we're made for influence is also what gets us in trouble, isn't it? And I think the reason I was laughing was, quite honestly, like 25-year-old me or maybe even 35-year-old me would have been so frustrated about a dumb tire that I blew out that now I have to replace again. And and then there's just this sense now of like, well, and probably some of it is like, I guess I'm not financially stressed and I can just go replace it. And some of it is like, man, life's too hard to worry about a flat tire that I have no control over whether or not that thing's blown out. But, But you could have told me to think that way at 22. I don't think that would have helped. Maybe it would have, but... I don't know that it would have given me that skill. What if you're made for influence and yet that has its own stewardship responsibility? And what if part of the game in any relationship, especially in parenting, is is recognizing like, when is it my job to let you learn this? And when is it my job to impart to you what I and my wisdom know already? And there's this, there's this, I want to nuance too the difference between influence and impact. Andy Crouch, in this really good book, if you're just looking for a fun, challenging, easy read, Andy Crouch is a great thinker, and he wrote a book called The Life We're Looking For. It's actually a pretty strong critique around some technology stuff. But one of the things he does well is he nuances and uh, words, or he contrasts words really well. And one of the contrasts he makes in there is this idea of impact versus influence, because he observes that that we're using this word impact a lot, like I want to impact my school, I want to impact that relationship, I want to impact my community, I want to impact my world. And he notes that up until a generation ago, the word impact was rarely used as a verb, and it was almost never used in a positive sense. That what they recognized was what what physicists tell us, and that is impact is generally a negative thing because it's a great deal of energy in a really small window of time. That up until recently, like hurricanes made impacts and earthquakes made impacts and asteroids made impacts. And they just asked this kind of whimsy question of like, so why are we using a word positively that mostly only increases your insurance rates or causes you to go to the emergency room? And of course, what he's noting there is we're not very patient. Like we wanna impact a relationship, but influence is different. It's slower, and I wonder if part of what makes it different is influence, uh, it requires a wisdom that sometimes impact does not. What if you're made for influence? But here's the catch for me, because some of you, we've been exploring this for years together. Next slide. What if God doesn't just share with you his power, but also the limits of his power? Now, just, I just want to acknowledge, like, when you start talking about God and power and limitations on God's power, like, you've just opened up a giant can of worms in the theological space. So I'm not really interested in the nuances of the extent to which God chose it or it was imparted on him, whatever. But what if, to the extent that God makes us image bearers, which means God shares his power, what if part of the mental game is recognizing that God doesn't just share his power, but the limitations on power? Look at Genesis 6, not long after things started so bright and went so terribly bad, there's this very, what I want to just call honest section of of Scripture. The Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Like, I, I don't even like absolute statements and this one's just loaded with absolute statements. And the Lord was sorry that he'd made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Like observationally, what, what, what is the author allowing us to observe about God? This God can be sad. This God can feel regret or grief. There's this razor thin le- line between the extent to which God experiences human things like emotions and then there's Genesis 6 which seems to say like this God, he was bummed. He was, he was sad, he was grieved. Now again, I get there, there's a theological conversation here, but practically speaking, what is God being confronted with? Isn't it on some level, God also has to face life when his power is checked? Now is it the same for us? I don't think it is, but practically it, it seems real similar, doesn't it? That God also at times had to look at relationships 
and go, whew, all I can do is grieve here because in his case, I opted not to have power in this space. So my question is if, if, if we're called to be image bearers of God, which means we're called for God's power and God's influence, if we're called to steward what it means to be image bearers of God in that positive kind of power influence sense, are we also called to steward those moments when said power isn't there, when it's checked? And isn't that a part of the mental game that at times is, is so frustrating? And this brings me back to this idea of maturity. Like we're so used to this statement now, like you have arrived, you have arrived. But what if we need to be careful with going like, no, 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 we grow in maturity. We don't just arrive on this issue. I mean, think of marriage. The, the proverbial first two years that are so hard, isn't it? Oftentimes this collision course of wills. Leadership, life. You know, I was re- meeting recently, and I sh- asked his permission to share this story. I was meeting recently with somebody who had made a series of decisions and developed some habits that created a lot of pain uh, for the people he shares a household with. Uh, the result was some, some, well, just, I won't give details, but some, some tough stuff. And as I sat with him, I knew the context of this when we, we were getting together, and about 15 minutes in, what occurred to me, I actually thought back to a chapter in Richard Foster's book called The Celebration of Discipline where he talks about confession. And I continue to be compelled by the notion, but I'm not doing anything with it. Uh, he, he talks about just the power of confessing to another person. You, you're, you're wrong, your brokenness, your sin, even if you're not confessing to the person you hurt, but just the power of that. And at about the 15-minute mark of sitting with this friend, I, that, that's where my head went, was like what he's doing right now is confessing. There was no excuses. He, he, he wasn't, he wasn't kind of hedging it in any way. I mean, it was just pure confession to somebody who he hadn't hurt. Like, here's all the things that I've done. And I continued to listen, and it was, at that, to that, at that point, it was almost worshipful just to listen to somebody just kind of own their stuff and hear their strategy and their way forward and what it is that they're doing. And somewhere in there, and I did eventually get to share this with me, the next thing that occurred to me was, I think what you're describing right now is, and this is be this new kind of phrase that's been helpful to me, it's an area where, where, where late, modern, megachurch evangelicalism has maybe let you down. And that's not to say I think it's all bad, I've been a part of that, I'm, I love certain aspects of that. I think in particular, late modern evangelicalism has been really good at leading people to a point of decision, that, that conversion is a valuable thing, that having those decisive moments, whether they're in a day or a season, that's all important. But what I kept hearing as I was listening to him was from, from the vantage point through the lens of scripture, it felt to me like what he was doing despite the sin was the very thing Jesus promised to do, and that is like, Continue to grow him in holiness. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And what felt to me like what was initially he was grieving the like, I made this decision maybe a decade ago to follow Jesus. Stuff like this isn't supposed to happen now. And from my perspective, it was like, no, God is being faithful. He's, he's growing you in his image. There's this maturity thing that, that has to happen. You know, Paul in Philippians Go to the next slide, Marla. Thank you. Therefore, he said, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my present, but much more in my absence. I mean, here's a scandalous phrase. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I'm not trying to necessarily make allowance for my friend's issues and brokenness and sin. But at the same time, for me, what I was able to portray to him is like, this is all part and parcel of the deal. This long journey of God purifying behavior and character over time. And I guess I just wanted to create a moment in this series where we point out what we all know, and that is there's limits to your power, and life gets really exhausting when you can't acknowledge that. But also to go, what if part of the mental game is just staying close enough, abiding enough, that we trust that God, God's going to make us better at this? that the three-year-old's just not as good at soccer as the 18-year-old. And sure, some people, are, they, they have a, a head start over others, but, but what if this is one of those fields of life where like, time is required and experience is required? And so is friendship then, so that we can ask people 
to help us discern, is this one of these moments or is this one of these moments? And I take a lot of solace when I read the text to see that like, this is a human thing. I mean, look at Proverbs 21.31. It says this, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. What, among other things, what is that but the reflection of a community of people who have somehow been confronted by this very same tension? There's things I control, and there's things I don't, and God help me like in the most literal sense of the word. So I guess uh, there's a few areas where I'm hoping maybe this can land for you. One is in a very specific one, like maybe there's an area where things are twisted up for you, and maybe you just haven't taken the time to, to take inventory and go, okay, so is this one of those areas, God, where I need to roll up my sleeves and exert my power? Or is this one of those areas where I need to do the other God work, which is acknowledge my lack of power? And the other thing that I've seen over time is This can also manifest itself habitually in two different ways. Like I jokingly say we're all control freaks, but some of you are fundamentally the opposite of that. It's the way you've coped with life. You've learned because of who you're married to or who you're in relationship with or the way you were raised or just whatever reason where you worked. You've learned that like life is just easier if you don't care, if you don't have an opinion, if you don't exert your power. And I wonder if one of the spiritual practices, if you will, for you would just be to once a day identify an area, it might be as simple as which street you turn on, where you're gonna actually have an opinion to speak up. I wonder if that might be a helpful discipline. And I wonder that because I don't have that problem, I have the other one. And one of the things that I do when I'm healthy and because I've been back in this kind of vein of thinking recently, I've been practicing again, is just to try to identify one thing a day and sometimes I pick it in advance where I'm like just fundamentally not going to make a decision. So like for, for me, and this is silly, but it happened on Wednesday night where I just showed up for a bike ride and I had pre-decided like I'm not picking the route. I'm not putting input into the route. I'm going to put myself third so that I just don't have a vote. And for me, it was, I know that might make me sound like a horrible person and mostly I am, but <laughs> it's just this, it's a conscious decision to just reinforce to my own flesh and blood that life is okay when things don't go the way that you thought they needed to. And actually, that was like the hardest ride I've been on in a long time, so I don't think I'll do that one for a while again. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. What, what if? What if God made you for power and life with Jesus is this long game of learning to walk with him by his spirit in discerning those moments and developing the character to more instinctively recognize like here's an area where I'm gonna get involved and here's an area where I'm not. You know, you think of the cross and communion and it seems I almost, I had to pull a whole bunch of different stuff out of here because I think there's also the opportunity and I'll just kind of leave it as one little thought that part of what Jesus reveals is that the best use of power is service. And it seems like there's a whole other nuance there manifest in the cross. A Jesus who, for a moment, stood up to Pilate. Like, if I wanted to call down angels from heaven, I could, but I'm not. So I'd like to pray. We're gonna give you a chance to receive communion up here if you wanna be a part of that. There's also these verse cards if you wanna snag one of those. God, Lord, you gave us this great responsibility called being image bearers, and with it, we, we carry this incredible capacity for good and an equally incredible capacity for evil. And Jesus, we recognize that the, the, whole, the whole point of the cross was this, this rescue, this redemption, this rehumanizing your project. So God, as I think about the homes and the neighborhoods and the office places and the friendships and the, the teams, the squads, the dorms, there's such a broad array of areas where, where this room scatters back into that you'd help us show up as image bearers of you. And to that extent, you'd help us uh, do that by this keen awareness uh, that we have lightning in our fingertips and yet we're, we're called to use it with wisdom. And at times to acknowledge the lack of the call to use it. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us online at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook or Instagram.